This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. The passing of Benedict XVI on Saturday morning was one of those moments in modern church history that will likely be remembered as one of those times where people's true colors were shown, and it may also be remembered as one of those moments when things suddenly changed overtly and not for the better. I'll go more into the latter in the future. But today I want to show you how the modernists didn't wait until Benedict was gone before the knives came out to attack his memory and place blame for the consequences of their own evil ideas at his feet. And I will also provide an answer many of you have been asking for. What do the folks who that you call Benny Vacantists, what do they say about Benedict and what do they do now that the Pope is gone? I don't hold to their position, but I know plenty who do, and I reached out to one who gave me a brief comment, and I'll share that with you at the end of this video. So let's just dive into this. Before we do that, though, I want to thank the patrons and channel members for their continued support of Return to Tradition in the new year. Your support has kept these messages coming, and for that I do thank you, as does my family. If you want to help, there are options in the description box below, including a link to Subscribestar, which is the Patreon alternative that respects speech as well as Patreon and that join button. People who support do so for like a dollar a month. It's pretty cheap. Anyway, thanks and let's see if you can see the subtle web the modernists are weaving, which is meant to link all the worst things in the modern church to Benedict XVI and by extension to American traditionalists. Many of us are expecting that Benedict's role in the 2003 mess of the bishops and yes, popes sweeping the mess of bad priests doing unspeakably evil things involving the most vulnerable, including altar boys under the rug, would be highlighted soon. We've been expecting that. And to a degree, that does need to happen in the interest of the truth. True things are true whether we like them or not, and Benedict certainly made mistakes in handling that situation. No one disputes that. But what we've been expecting is Benedict to take the starring role in the mess, to be the fall guy for that whole problem. And like clockwork, while his body was still warm, it began. Remember, we're talking about wicked deeds done by men who were protected by every pope, including Francis, until such a time that the pressure got too great to keep protecting them. Francis kept McCarrick around until he couldn't anymore, and he has others like him. Francis himself keeps protecting men like this, including bishops like Zanqueta from Argentina, who was like a junior league version of Ted McCarrick in South America. And we're talking about this in light of Francis parting Father Rupnik for his evil deeds involving nuns. These attacks come and will come in the future from people who defend Francis at every turn. So, with that having been said, headline from Commonweal Magazine. Pope Benedict XVI dies, 1927 to 2022. The article is, one by, uh, is by one of the preeminent propagandists for the Francis regime, Massimo Fascioli, who is an Italian thinker who, for, who writes for an American audience. He's stridently and eloquently pro-Francis, and he is not to be taken lightly. To my knowledge, this is the first attack on Benedict that came from a high-profile source, and he honestly probably wrote this article when the news came out that Benedict was in his final hours. This was published on December 31st, just hours after he passed away. Again, literally when Benedict's body was still warm. And the best part about this is it's a subtle attack. It's not written in an over-the-top way that will be obviously bad taste because Mr. Fascioli is too smart to do that. The, pe the piece begins with the facts of his passing and then goes, as these things typically do, into his contributions to the modernist revolution in the Church of Vatican II because Benedict was there. He was one of the foot soldiers. He helped. He's then described as a John Paul II alter ego, which I'll let you decide if that's fair or not. Just remember that before Benedict was dragged through the mud over the handling of Ted McCarrick, John Paul II was by Francis. They tried to blame him and Vigano for it. But then we get this, the, his first error in the minds of the modernists, the hermeneutic of continuity and Samorum pontificum. From the article, quote, In December 2005, eight months after becoming Pope, Benedict delivered a speech in which he laid out his interpretation of Vatican II as a, quote, hermeneutic of continuity and reform, as opposed to a, quote, hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture. This soon proved problematic. Response to this framing came to function as a litmus test of orthodoxy for some interpreters of the Council, who as supporters of Benedict focused far more on continuity than reform, 
rather than thinking of them together as the Pope had described. Yet at the same time, it's hard to find an example of, quote, reform that Benedict himself proposed that didn't try to undo changes brought about by Vatican II and the early post-conciliar period. Also problematic was his 2007 motu proprio, which reintroduced and encouraged use of the pre-Vatican II liturgical rite. This reinvigorated the traditionalists in the church, especially in the United States, and legitimized a theological agenda not only obsessed with quote-unquote liturgical abuses and desacralization, but also hostile to Vatican II itself. The resurgence of an anti-Vatican II agenda in the last few years, and not just on the fringes of Catholicism, must be viewed as part of Benedict's legacy, end quote. That's you and me, folks. That's who they're talking about. Our existence, our demands of the faith we are taught today be the same faith as that taught to our great-grandparents is a problem for them and must be viewed as part of Benedict's legacy. They want to label him a traditionalist, even though, honestly, Benedict wasn't a traditionalist. He wasn't. Most traditionalists reject the hermeneutic continuity that Benedict proposed as a sort of a sort of moderate point between the hermeneutic of rupture from the modernists and the hermeneutic of rupture from trads. I'm using technical language here, I guess, so let's really kind of define what I mean. The hermeneutic of continuity, that's the middle point that Benedict espoused, basically says everything Vatican II did has to be seen and understood in light of what the church taught before Vatican II. It has to be in continuity with that, meaning you have to find a way to square what the church said on a whole host of issues that don't really line up, like the church after Vatican II endorsing religious liberty with the condemnations of religious liberty taught by the church before Vatican II. You can't line them up. They don't work. But you have to. And it's just one example. The modernists celebrate what they see as a rupture. We see this in the statements of Cardinal Roach and Francis, saying that the central theories about the church change dramatically after Vatican II, that the way the church is and sees itself in the world changed after Vatican II, and that we have a functionally different religion, and that the Latin Mass isn't compatible with that faith anymore. Trads agree with the modernists, but not for the reasons the modernists would like. We simply say you cannot square the obvious breaks in the faith after the council from what was always taught before the council. Benedict tried to bridge the gap, because you have to, otherwise you've got a massive problem on your hands. But you can't. It doesn't work. Massimo Fascioli is the voice of Francis in America. And many trads looked at Benedict as someone who didn't actively hate the faith, and didn't actively hate traditional Catholics. Hence why we liked him. It's a low bar for liking someone, I guess, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. And we also could tell that Benedict loved our Lord, and he loved the church. Now, they're trying to link Benedict to trads. And then it gets worse because you might not think that that's that bad. But now trads equal Benedict, and we trads are his fault for giving us our mass back. And now he brings in the problem of evil men, who are the priests doing evil things to the most vulnerable. Mr. Fascioli breaks this up across the rest of the article, so I'm just going to put it all in one place here for you. Quote, it was under his, Benedict's, pontificate that the church also began to face up to the magnitude of the Ted McCarrick problem, beginning with sanctions against Father Maciel Maciel, founder of the Legionaries of Christ. Through the punishments were, vile, were mild, they at least signaled an end to the denial of the crisis by John Paul II and led to a visible shift in the Vatican's approach to acknowledging and addressing the Ted McCarrick problems and abuse of power, especially since 2018. Both as Cardinal and Pope, Ratzinger met with some failures or came up short. He was unsuccessful in recasting the papacy in such a way that a Pope could avoid being a spokesman for a post-European global Catholic Church and for interreligious dialogue, a posture since embraced and embodied by Francis. Ratzinger also did not work to bring about the canonical and theological change that the Ted McCarrick problems made painfully and clearly necessary. Instead, he continued to view the scandal through the lens of the most of the post-1968 culture war, and he never made a real attempt at reforming the Vatican and the central government of the Catholic Church. End quote. All those problems, all the problems in the modern church are Benedict's fault. Now, there's no mention there that Benedict's mail was intercepted and read by the St. Gallen group and the men they placed in the Roman Curia. No mention that for all his good works on this problem, Francis repeatedly promoted men and gave them shelter who were known to be involved in those sins. He does this to this day. And no acknowledgement 
that there is a perfect statistical correlation between men of the, um, we'll say, James Martin persuasion in the priesthood and those evil deeds we're talking about, especially since men like Massimo Fagioli want to take a very liberal approach with them. None. It's just Benedict's fault. Could he have done more? Absolutely, but that's not the point here. The point is to open the door for more attacks. And you just wait and see. More articles from modernist outlets and from modernist shows are going to come to place the blame for these sins at Benedict's feet. And he can't defend himself. Remember, Benedict XVI now equals traditionalist Catholics. That's the framing. Don't let them tell you anything different. At the start of this, I mentioned, by the way, what most of you call the Benny Vacantis problem. Now, first, the proper term is not Benny Vacantist. That is a modernist slur used to undermine their point and make dismiss their argument without examining it. Let's be honest enough with ourselves to take the question seriously, and let's respect our fellow right-thinking Catholics enough, enough to ditch the slur. I don't hold to their position, by the way, just to be clear, but they prefer the term Benny Plenist. It means we have a pope and it is Benedict. That's what Benny, Benny Plenist means. Benny of a contest is an attempt to lump them in with set of a contest, because the underlying assumption is that set of a contest are all bad. I don't even think that set of a contest are bad, but let's be honest and not lump all of them in one place together. I asked a member of the clergy that I know who is a Benny Plenist what many of you were wondering. In my live stream on Saturday morning, I repeatedly got questions asking what Benny, Benny Plenist will do now that Benedict is gone. I said I'd try to get one that I knew on the show to talk about it in a live stream. I didn't really think, th think through what I was saying, because the problem is the one that I know is a priest, and it would be catastrophically bad for him if he admitted in public his opinions, which I wasn't thinking about at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning before the coffee had really kicked in. But he did provide a statement that I have his permission to read to you without identifying him. So he, a here is a statement from a priest who is a Benny Plenist. Quote, Set of a contest means one who believes that there has not been a valid pope since 1958 and does not describe any of us who believe Benedict XVI has been our only reigning pope since 2005 until his passing. Objectively, the church is currently in interregnum, meaning we are in a period between two reigning popes, B16, Benedict XVI, and a future pope. But we are in an interregnum state that most Catholics do not recognize because of an unprecedented squatting of an unopposed anti-pope. While it's true we've never had a pagan worshipping and blaspheming anti-pope deceive 99.9% .9 of the quote-unquote faithful, the church has been interregnum 200 plus times in her history. In fact, most objective interregnum periods in 2,000 years of church history have been met with subjective ignorance of that period by most Catholics. This is because news of the death of a pope often reached people long after the choosing of the next pope, at least before the 19th century. I admit we're currently in a much bigger pickle than in those times in the past, but it just shows the objective state of the church is not always recognized, much less determined by the majority of the faithful, or even the cardinals, end quote. So the Benny Plan is saying we're in an interregnum. On Facebook, Father Paul Kramer also briefly answered a question about this when he referenced Catholic prophecy to remind us that St. Ignatius of Santia and Blessed Anna Maria Taigi prophesied that there would be a long interregnum after a troubled pontiff died. That interregnum would last between two to three years, no longer than four. I'm not familiar with the prophecies he referenced. A quick look online showed me that the one referencing St. Ignatius was uh, is disputed. Blessed Anna Maria Taigi is most famous for her Three Days of Darkness prophecy, but I will look into these more for you. Now that I haven't said... I don't hold to the Benny Plenis position, and I'll refrain here from giving you my predictions about how bad things are likely to get. I'm going to, but I'm just not going to do it now. I will save those predictions for either the day of Benedict's funeral or after, because I have publicly said I think it's really gross how some commentators are doing right now. Said I will preach to you here what I've said in my live stream. Pray for the repose of Benedict's soul. It's a Catholic thing to do. Even if you regard him as one of the great villains of modern church history, pray for his soul. And try to have the class not to go onto social media and tell everyone that you know he's in fiery perdition now because that is grotesquely sinful. And shame on you for those of you who have been doing that. Only God knows Benedict's final destination. You certainly don't. And to pretend otherwise is the sin of presumption. And it displays a, low, a gross lack of charity and total classlessness. I dealt with these kind of comments all weekend on social media and especially over on Rumble. And now I am thinking seriously of disconnecting my YouTube channel from Rumble. 
the experiment of having an alternative platform over on Rumble has failed and failed spectacularly and has only brought out the worst elements of the trad world. It really has. So I'm seriously considering disconnecting from Rumble. What do you think about this, though? Did you see the subtle attacks on Benedict and what they're going to do moving forward? Do you see the attempt to link Benedict to trads and then link the McCarrick problems all together into one insidious witch's brew of modernist propaganda? Let me know in the comments, please, what you thought of all this. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As does sharing on social media these videos. It really helps as well. As always, pray for the church and pray for the repose of the soul of Joseph Ratzinger. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.